Okay, so welcome again, everybody assisting us. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third session of our online series on the uh, 22 presidential and parliamentary elections in Brazil. It's an online election series organized by USP University in Brazil and Institut Ibero-Americano uh, in Germany. Uh, me and my colleague, me, Bruno Speck, and my colleague, Peter Birle, uh, put together the program. Uh, in total, we have six sessions. And this, as I said, is our third sessions, session entitled Domestic Politics and Social Movements. Our uh, housekeeping advice is that we have two presentations of roughly 20 minutes, and then we go into discussion of uh, roughly again, two times 20 minutes uh, after, the, after the presentations. Uh, and I now will briefly introduce our two uh, panelists today. First, we have Malu Gato. She's an associate professor on Latin American politics at the University College in London, UCL. And she's currently on research leave as a visiting fellow at the Kellogg Institute of International Studies at the University of Notre Dame. She just told us she's wrapping up uh, her stay there and will return on Monday. Her work explores question about political behavior representation, policy making, and gender. And she has a regional, regional focus on Latin America and, and especially on Brazil. She also provides analysis on Brazilian politics and women's political representation in media outlets like the New York Times, the Financial Times, Washington Post, and so on. Our second guest today is Samira Bueno. Uh, she is a replacement for uh, Renato, uh, who um, uh, has suffered a minor surgery and couldn't uh, do the presentation today. But she is an excellent repla replacement since she's the executive director of the Brazilian Forum of Public Safety. Uh, and she has a master, also master and a PhD in public administration and government from the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Sao Paulo. So welcome to everybody uh, again, and I would now give the floor to Malu, who will have roughly 20 minutes to give her, her initial input before we go to the discussion. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. Um, this is a really great, uh, great initiative, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to reflect a little bit on uh, feminist organizing during the Bolsonaro years. Um, there's a lot to be said about feminist responses to Bolsonaro's time in office, and in particular to um, his government's uh, public policies and how they have had uh, both, uh, you know, gendered consequences uh, through targeted as well as non-targeted policies that have had uh, gendered consequences. But um, as some of you may know, and as uh, Bruno was was saying in the introduction, most of my work is on political representation of women. Uh, and so I deal with elections and electoral behavior as well. And so the obstacles and opportunities uh, for women to access office. And so although there is a lot to say about feminist responses to public policy more broadly, um, given you know the types of work that I do, I'll be focusing today on women and feminist responses to Bolsonaro when it comes to elections. And so both women organizing um, to try to avoid Bolsonaro's election in both uh, 2018 as well as uh, now in 2022, as well as efforts that have taken place to, uh, you know, mobilize, train, and elect people who would uh, come into office as opposition to not only Bolsonaro, but conservative politics that uh, could uh, pose uh, 
uh, a threat to the interest of women's rights and, and progressive uh, and, and the protection of human rights more broadly. And so let me take us back to 2018. And so when we, you know, when we're in 2018 and Bolsonaro starts appearing as the most competitive right wing candidate, that in and of itself is a disruption of the traditional, uh, you know, dynamics that we're used to in presidential elections in Brazil. Um, something that Claudio has already spoken about in the first meeting of these uh, these sessions here. And so I won't spend a lot of time on that. But the main point here is that Bolsonaro posed a different threat than a candidate uh, of the uh, PSDB, right, Brazil Central Right Wing Party that traditionally competed against uh, the PT in presidential elections posed to women's rights. Uh, and he was no stranger to feminist activists, uh, uh, and of course, for all the wrong reasons, Bolsonaro was known for both his misogynistic rhetoric as well as his misogynistic attitudes. And so that did create uh, a worry uh, and a reaction from women and from feminist movements. And so even in early polls that started taking place in August of 2018, we started observing something that caught a lot of people by surprise, and that was a very clear gender gap in support for Bolsonaro. And so in prior years, you know, when we would look at public opinion polls and support for candidates, we wouldn't really see this clear gender gap in support for any given party or candidate. And that started emerging very clearly uh, in 2018. Um, and, you, you know, it was Bolsonaro that was essentially pulling, uh, that, that was leading to this gap emerging. And so if we look at the polls that were conducted on the 22nd of August of that year, we saw that 14% of women indicated support for Bolsonaro versus 30% of men. So we already see, you know, this, this big gap in support. Yeah. And, um, sorry? No, no, it's nothing. Okay. And um, on 28th of September, and so right before um, the first round of the elections, we saw that 21% of women declared support for Bolsonaro versus 37% of men. And so here a difference of 16 percentage points. And so we're already seeing, you know, women are reacting electorally to Bolsonaro. Um, now, what we were seeing in terms of women's reactions to, you know, this misogynistic candidate that did... Uh, pose, you know, that, that projected a threat to women's rights was not only on public opinion polls, it was also taking place in women's organizing and social media, as well as on the streets. And this took a very different type of organizing than in prior elections. And so perhaps the first thing that we started to notice was this Facebook group that was organized called Mulheres Unidas Contra Bolsonaro, so Women United Against Bolsonaro, which reached over 4 million women uh, in a private Facebook group uh, during the elections. This group organized both, um, you know, campaigns online. And so one of the things that became really well known during the election was the hashtag campaign, campaign Now that, you know, not only was used on Facebook, but also became quite popular on Twitter uh, and elsewhere. This is not to say that women were also not mobilizing in favor of Bolsonaro, right? There were also pockets of women's women mobilizing as women in favor of Bolsonaro as a reaction to this uh, women-centric movement uh, against Bolsonaro. But, you know, as the public opinion polls uh, suggest, you know, women were more hesitant to support Bolsonaro. And what they did was not only organize online, but also take it to the streets. And so on the 29th of September, women organized the largest women-led protests um, in Brazil. Um, I conducted a survey with members of this Facebook group post elections. And I think that that leads to some really interesting results. Let me just stop for a moment from telling about this to first tell you about why uh, and how I got interested in studying this. And that's because you know, being someone who studies women's political representation and participation, uh, I'm really interested in the types of factors that may trigger women to become more polit politically engaged and to participate at higher rates in elections. 
And one thing that happened in 2016, if you recall, in the 2016 U.S. elections, is that we had Donald Trump on the one side and Hillary Clinton on the other. Now, gender and politics literature talks a lot about the role of role models in prompting women's political engagement. And Hillary Clinton herself used this rhetoric of, you know, it would be important for girls and young women to see a woman in the U.S. presidency so that they can see politics as a place where women belong and that that can lead them to then participate at higher rates of election. And of course, we know that then Donald Trump went to win the election and what followed was mass mobilization from women and um, women starting to uh, you know, become more interested in, in, in running for office at, high, at, at the highest rates in the U.S. And so the U.S. has this long history of candidate training programs and women were starting to seek those programs and, and you know, um, record numbers post Trump's elections. And this got some U.S. scholars as well as, you know, myself thinking about, well, you know, there is all of this literature about role models potentially triggering uh, women's engagement, but there may be something else here, which is uh, a mechanism through which fear or of, you know, uh, threat of what a government could potentially uh, represent in terms of reversal of women's rights, right, um, or threat to women's rights and human rights more broadly that could also lead to political engagement. Now, let me get back to the um, women united against the Bolsonaro and this survey that I conducted with women in this group because um, that suggests that indeed that was what's what, what was going on in Brazil. And so um, about uh, a little over 900 women from the group um, answered the survey that I conducted within the group. Now that's a convenient sample um, and it's, you know, I, I to be honest, I don't know how representative that was of women in the group. After uh, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, you can't get information about the characteristics of people from Facebook groups. And so, you know, but what I do have to say is that these are women from like all um, uh, ethnicities and races. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a group from all ages um, as well. And in fact, uh, you know, most of the women, so over 75% uh, of the women are over 24 years old, also uh, all levels of socioeconomic, um, also, uh, socioeconomic strata. Uh, but again, I don't know how representative it is of the group, but some, th there's some interesting insights that still come from these uh, data. And um, so just, just some numbers here, 70% of the women who responded to the survey, so 70% of the uh, over 900 women who responded said that their involvement in the 2018 elections was much higher than in any prior elections. And again, you know, uh, over 70% of the, around 75% of the women in, in the sample were over 24 years old, right? And so they have had uh, prior elections where they were at least voters. Um, and so for 70% of them, their involvement was much higher. 22% 20, of them said that their um, involvement and engagement in the election was at least somewhat higher, um, and only 6% said that it was the same than in prior elections. And so it does seem that something about, you know, Bolsonaro himself did lead to higher rates of mobilization uh, among women. And so Bolsonaro here, uh, or the threats that Bolsonaro would pose, uh, would potentially pose to to women as a catalyst for women's political engagement. Um, uh, another, a few other figures that uh, to me were really interesting was that for 14% of women, it was the first in the group, it was the first time uh, the 20, it, during the 2018 elections, it was the first time that they had ever participated in a protest. And here it's worth thinking about the prior years of Brazilian politics where there were quite a few protests going on, right? Uh, in terms of like women's, uh, uh, sorry, in terms of uh, uh, Dilma's impeachment, uh, you know, the student mobilizations in 2013. So it wasn't like there hadn't been opportunities for these women to protest. Uh, but still, for 14% of them, it was the first time that they had ever protested. For 50% of women who responded, it was the first time they participated in a women-led movement. And so here we're also seeing how 
um, you know, essentially Bolsonaro's um, uh, success in the electoral uh, campaigns is leading women to mobilize as women and to become part of women groups. And 13% of them said that it was during the 2018 elections that they started to self-identify as feminists, which I also thought was a really interesting uh, piece of information, both uh, you know, national public opinion polls uh, conducted in 2018, as well as those conducted now in 2022, uh, do make an association between uh, feminist self-identification and rejection to Bolsonaro, which is not surprising, right? But but the fact that these women are then becoming more politically engaged and starting to self-identify as feminists, um, I think it's is is an interesting part of the uh part of the um of the explanation of what's what's going on here as well. And so you have this this thing that's like sort of feeding itself, right? Um, but women were not only taking action when it comes to preventing Bolsonaro from winning. Uh, but also in their efforts to try to elect more women, as well as people from other politically marginalized groups that could be opposition to Bolsonaro, but not only to Bolsonaro. Here we're thinking about conservative politics that uh, threatens women's rights more broadly. And so um, since 2020, I've been conducting research in partnership with uh, Instituto Epidechi and in co-authorship with Deborah Tomé on what we're calling candidate support catalysts. These are a new type of electoral actor in Brazil. Um, these are civil society organizations in the sense that they are uh, non-governmental entities that are led by civil society actors and that are nonpartisan. But they're very different from traditional civil society organizations because their main goal is to um, recognize and recruit talent and then train people to run for office. Um, these organizations have become, uh, have emerged in 2016 and then became very popular since then. In the 2020 elections, uh, so municipal elections, Debra and I mapped 48 candidate support catalysts uh, working in Brazil, 14 of which um, were focused solely on recruiting and training women to run for office, and six of which were focused on uh, training Afro-Brazilian women only. Others were also focused on, you know, training LGBTQI plus people or indigenous people or Afro-Brazilians. Uh, the minority of them were open to everyone. Um, of the organizations that focus on women specifically, Although the you know the overwhelming majority of them do not have an ideological um, orientation per se, uh, most of them have sort of like a litmus test, or um, you know their members have to be um, have to have commitments to promote women's rights, uh, or at least be committed to uh, some elements or or some. Uh, uh, policy agendas, such as, for example, that of having more women in politics. And, and uh, you know, this, this varies quite a bit. Um, one very interesting thing of these organizations, and now we are conducting, and we're in the process of conducting um, a new uh, set of surveys with these organizations, as well as interviewing uh, leaders of these organizations. And by the way, the number has increased. And so in the 2022 elections, we've identified almost 70 of these organizations operating in Brazil, again, to elect people from marginalized groups from office. And this came from both, you know, and, and this is what we're getting now is, you know, the reasons for their emergence is not only this idea of having to come back, combat um, conservative politics that um, that poses a threat to uh, the rights of women and other politically marginalized groups, but also uh, they emerge from this idea that political parties are not doing what they're supposed to do when it comes to promoting the political representation of marginalized groups, and that they are then filling this gap by trying to both um, you know, recruit these people as well as offer them the tools that political parties oftentimes do not offer them. And so both in terms of resources and access to, for example, uh, campaign teams and, you know, things like 
uh, professional uh, photographs and uh, websites and social media advice, etc., um, as well as uh, other things such as, for example, psychological support that is really important in particular for people from marginalized groups who suffer gendered and racialized types of violence during the campaign trail. And so, um, you know, my time is almost up. And so I'll stop here with saying that, you know, when it comes to, there's a lot to be said. And, you know, even at, in the last few days of the Bolsonaro government, we're seeing uh, how Bolsonaro um, uh, aliados in the in the Congress are trying to push for the Estatuto do Nascituro, right, which would essentially uh, make, uh, you know, even re women's reproductive rights are already incredibly restricted in Brazil, and it would make access to abortion almost impossible to access, even in the circumstances that are currently allowed by law. And so, you know, it's not to say that there aren't other aspects to talk about um, women's and, and feminist resistance to, uh, to the Bolsonaro government. But I did want to emphasize that there has been, you know, feminist and women's organizing in this electoral arena, uh, and that this has come uh, both from, you know, women themselves who may not necessarily identify as feminists, but who have uh, resisted uh, Bolsonaro in the polls, um, as well as with women um, campaigning and mobilizing against Bolsonaro, something that has had this, this sort of like cyclical effect in leading women to also self-identify as feminist, uh, as feminists and, and become more involved in women's movements, as well as this more on the ground movement uh, that's not only about Bolsonaro himself, but in training and essentially um, thinking about leadership uh, in a more medium to long term, uh, with a more medium and long term goals of, of having people in office who will be able to uh, essentially oppose any other potential future rises of uh, conservative leadership in Brazil. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Malu, for this very insightful input. I have lots of questions, but before that, we will move to Samira. Uh, thank you so much. For again, I would like to thank Bruno for the generous invitation. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, sharing this space with all of you, especially with Malu. It's great to hear from you. And I would like to talk briefly about the Brazilian Forum of Public Safety, uh, this organization, which I'm a di director. The Forum is a non-governmental, non non-profit organization that works mainly on the production of data and evidence on crime, violence, and public security in Brazil. And we are a very unique organization made up of researchers, activists, and police officers. So. Here are some of our main publications, or Statistical Yearbook, The Atlas of Violence, and, and others. But So let's go. <laughs> let's begin. Well, Brazil is historically a very violent country. Since the redemocratization of the country in the 80s, homicides have grown exponentially, and robberies, drug trafficking, and different criminal modalities spread throughout the country. At the same time, the fear of crime and violence become a central element of the Brazilian population daily life. In 2017, the country experienced one of its most dramatic moments with the declared war between the country's two main criminal organizations, PCC and Comando Vermelho, so PCC and uh, Red Command. Uh, well, this war between these two uh, uh, criminal organizations resulted in more than 66,000 people murdered and dozens of inmates killed in criminal faction wars inside prisons. That same year, the global study on homicide from UN showed that Brazil concentrated less than 3% of the world's population, but 11% of all murders on the planet. Despite this dramatic picture, in 2018, we had important advances and innovations in the field of public security, and since then, homicides have dropped, despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 
In formal terms, the approval of the legislation that creates the Unified Public Security System, the SUSP, which had been in Congress for more than 20 years, represented an important advance in guaranteeing the federal government greater protagonism in the coordination of the national public security policy. In the same year, the National Public Security Fund law was changed, creating a stable source of resources to finance these public policies and also expanding its budget. Also in 2018, the National Public Safety Plan was approved, which should guide the actions of the Union until 2030. I believe it's possible to say that in 2018, we experienced an alignment of the stars with the creation for a short period of time of a specific Ministry for Public Security and an armistice between organized criminal groups. Bolsonaro's election, however, has put these advances at risk. Elected with a discourse of violent confrontation against criminality, his administration was marked by a populist discourse with proposals to extend legal guarantees for police officers who commit murders on duty and a revision of the national security plan that had been approved just a year before, removing all provisions related to gun control, to fighting domestic violence or prevention actions aimed at, at minorities. In a very summarized perspective, Bolsonaro has prioritized three action strategies that I would like to highlight in this presentation. In a first strategy, right at the beginning of his mandate, Bolsonaro dismantled the gun control policy that had been enforced in the country since 20, uh, 2003, Estatuto de Desarmamento. Through a set of about 40 decrees and normative acts, he facilitated the mechanisms for the purchase of firearms and ammunition and different, different possibilities for licensing the possession and carrying of weapons. As a result, Brazil today is a much more armed country with even more precarious mechanisms, mechanisms of armed control. To cite some figures, the number of people with CAC registration, so it's the acronym for hunters, shooters and collectors, grew more than 400 percent between since uh, 2018, the year before administration, the Bolsonaro's administration began. And since the process of obtaining a license to own a firearm must be made to the Brazilian army, which has no great requirements, the result is that criminals have started to get licensed and buy weapons legally. Different press vehicles have shown that criminal organizations, such as the PCC, the, the, the major criminal organization in Brazil, have been buying weapons to commit crimes, paying 65% cheaper and legally. The newspaper we started in Sao Paulo revealed that the rifles, which used to cost between 35,000 and 59,000 reais on the parallel market, now costs between 12,000 and 15,000. The army, for its part, acknowledged that it did not do, it, it did not to do a background check on a suspect who had accumulated 16 cases in the courts, including homicides and drug trafficking. And its own defense, the army said it relied on self declaration of trustworthiness, as if this were a reliable instrument in a country that has at least uh, 53 criminal organizations linked to drug trafficking. A more armed Brazil is the cursed inheritance that the Lula administration will have after 2023. Even if gun control legislation is reinstated, or even if new regulatory mechanisms are approved, the fact is that thousands and perhaps even millions of firearms are already in circulation. A second line of action of the Bolsonaro government in public security has as its strategy the approximation with the police universe. Bolsonaro materialized a dispute about the role of police forces in the control of social order. The truth is that Bolsonaro catalyzes the feeling of part of the Brazilian population that believes that the problem of our society is there are too many rights that universalization of human and civil rights are leftist issues, and that citizenship should continue to be regulated based on social and 
racial stratification. Despite his authoritarian project, the fact is that Bolsonaro was the only president in the democratic area who talked about public security, even with absurd proposals. By promising to raise salaries and attending police graduations and funerals, Bolsonaro managed to project the image that he really cares about his, this public, even though his promises have not come true. In the police forces, Bolsonarism is, there, is there, uh, derived from the process of political radicalization and, at the same time, from the inexistence of democratic governance mechanisms, since as stated by Renato Sergio Lima, who shares with me the coordination of the Brazilian Forum for Public Safety and would be initially here. Uh, the public security area coexists with a perfect veto system, where each pressure group has the strength to veto the, to veto the other group, but does not have enough strength to change the institutional architecture in its favor. And this translates into the fact that until today, more than 30 years after the approval of the federal constitution, practically all the infra-constitutional norms that regulate the management of the police forces come from authoritarian periods, like military dictatorship and even before, during the Vargas dictatorship. No police reform has been carried out and the 86 police forces in the country still operate their daily lives based on rules laws and regulations created by the dictatorship, which left deep marks in the organizational culture and professional identity of these institutions. The idea of security as a social right foreseen in our federal constitution has not been consolidated, and there is still the idea of fighting the internal enemy. In other words, Bolsonaro is the pol in the police is only a discursive update of practice that have not changed over the, over, uh, uh, the years and they are now explored in their fissures and tensions. And as an aggra aggravating factor in this process of Bolsonarization of the police forces, Brazil has experienced a growing movement of police officers into politics. In these year's elections, almost 2,000, 1,888, Candidates, candidates originating from the security forces were registered. Uh, a 27% growth compared to the, uh, the last election in 2018. The phenomenon of police officers in politics is so intense that military police officer is among the five most frequent occupations this year. Almost all of these candidates, 95%, are in right-wing or center-right-wing parties. On the one hand, the increase in the number of police officers running in elections can be seen as a sign of democ democratic vitality. Just like any other organized group, it's legitimate and provided for, a, for the constitution for police officers to run for office and demand improvements for their professional categories. On the other hand, this growth of police candidates, free from which the rules, can stimulate political radicalization. The, poli the politicization of the police force is not a new phenomenon and has been discussed for some years now. The police category, although it's complex to analyze it as something homogeneous, which it isn't, coexist with restrictions regarding the possibility of organizing in unions or going on strikes, which makes the search for spaces for contestation and change even more intense inside these, uh, the, the police forces. These restrictions, however, are justified. And essential services such as the security forces cannot afford to stop at the risk of their action leading the cities and society to chaos and violence. However, precisely because they are the armed branch of the state, clear limits should be set for the engagement of these professionals in politics, as other countries do. Chile, England, Portugal and the United States, for example, have rules to prevent police and military personnel from running for office. Other public careers, even in Brazil, such as judges and prosecutors, must resign from their posts to run for elected office. For police officers, however, you do not have to leave your police career 
to do so, unless you have less than 10 years of service. In this year's elections, 44 members of the security chief forces were elected to Congress out of a total of uh, 700 candidates only for the federal, the, the federal level. There is more than 670 police and military personnel returned to the barracks in November after failing at the polls. It's not a matter, therefore, of analyzing the possibility of politicization of police institutions, because politics has already entered the barracks and the police stations. And I think the most recent example of the deleterious aspect of political radicalization in the police environment was the riot of the military police in Ceará uh, two years ago in February of 2020. Uh, paralyzing the work of ostensive policing for uh, 13 days and leading the state to chaos, what resulted in more than 300 murders in, in the, the, the this period of two weeks. The radicalization of positions between police and members of the armed forces is not a strategy that passes only by the possibility of having this group as an electoral base, but mainly by their engagement in questioning the result of the polls. See, for example, uh, the conduct of police officers in the demonstrations by coup plotters who are unhappy with the electoral results and who have been camped in front of barracks for this last month and a half. And this week, literally, that, that they uh, set fire to, to Brazil. Well, uh, finally, uh, a third line of actions of the Bolsonaro administration that did not focus on the security area but produce echoes to which I would like to draw attention has to do with fighting gender-based violence, especially domestic violence. At least since the uh, 2000, uh, 2000s, Brazil had been trying to correct the course of its public policies for the prevention and reduction of violence against women, whose great symbol was the approval of the Maria da Penha law in 2006. Since then, many laws and public policies have been created and federal resources have been transferred to states and municipalities for the, implementation, for the implementation of public policies. Under Bolsonaro's, under Bolsonaro's right-wing government, however, human rights have suffered a setback and consequently, policies to address domestic violence have been disappeared, being erased. What I'm calling here erase occur in two ways. On the one hand, with the abrupt reduction of the budget of these policies, which suffered cuts of more than 90% during the Bolsonaro administration. And on the other hand, in an attempt to empty the understanding of gender as the guiding principle of public policies. The focus of the policy is no longer the woman as a subject of rights, but the family as an, as an, uh, an institution to be preserved at any cost, even if the family itself is the source of domestic violence. The result is that Brazil reached in the first half of this year the impressive mark of, of four feminicides per day, the highest number ever recorded since the approval of the law in 2015. It is worth noting here that eight, of, eight out of ten feminicides recorded last year were committed by the victim's partner or ex-partner, which reinforced the argument that feminicides essentially derive from domestic violence in Brazil. The data on sexual violence also reinforced the scenario that the family and the home can be spaces of much violence. Last year, more than 35,000 children and adolescents between 0 and 13 years of age were raped, data consolidated from the records at police stations. The victims, mostly girls, were raped inside home in 76% of the cases, and the perpetrators, parents and step-parents, cousins, brothers, uncles, and grandparents were listed as the main abuser, uh, abusers. Thus, by uh, stating in the government program that the starting and ending point of public policies and social actions of our, gov or of our government program will be the family, Bolsonaro takes away from women the possibility of being the subject of 
public policy rights, deliberately ignoring the fact that it's precisely in the family environment where girls and women most suffer violence. In short, the challenges for Brazilian public security policies from next year will be huge. If the election of President Lula makes us optimistic about the maintenance of democracy in Brazil, it's necessary to recognize that crime and violence are factors that weaken democratic, democratic values and reinforce preference for authoritarian politicians. That's it. Thank you so much, Samira. Thank you. Also, really valuable input for, for our discussion. Um, so, I will uh, ask everybody to uh, post questions whenever they uh, uh, feel comfortable. And we'll start with two questions on myself. Um, Malu, uh, that's very, very, really interesting, your oversight or your uh, report on on this recent gender gap appearing in Brazil. As far I, as I know, I'm not a specialist, but uh, I've read some papers. The gender gap, uh, which basically, is, basically says women and men have different political behavior, uh, was discovered roughly 20, 30 years ago now, and, uh, and hasn't been presented or documented uh, significantly in Latin America. Just taking the numbers on, on political participation, I think there are a couple of countries where uh, women uh, participate more and a couple of countries where they participate less. If you look at the time uh, frame, it's also very volatile. So if this is right, you have discovered something really significant and, and new. So my question, um, my, my one of my questions would be whether uh, there is some truth to what commentators said that there is not only the gender gap now, but there is also a backfiring to this new political engagement of women. I remember specifically comments on the Eli No on this movement during uh, the, the previous election. Um, there was some saying that it actually promoted Bolsonaro because the reaction to the engagement of women was, just to simplify, for men to stand behind Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro even more, because that was exactly what he represented. Uh, he wanted to cut back women's rights and put them back in place, uh, uh, so to say. So. Uh, do you have some uh, insights on on that, on the possible backfiring uh, argument? And Samira, uh, your first argument about Bolsonaro weaponizing uh, the Brazilian society, I, I always was struck by the contradiction between on one side standing for the values, not only the corporation's interest, but for the values of the military and the police on one side and, and on the other side promoting the weaponizing, weaponization of society, which basically means undermining the core value of the army and the military, which, which is to maintain the monopoly on, the, on, 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 on uh, exerting uh, power and, and uh, uh, in, 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 a, in any society, no? so normally those institutions appreciate uh, that they have the monopoly on using weapons and on exerting force. And I see a contradiction within Bolsonaro's preaching of weaponizing the society on one side and of defending those two core institutions uh, on the other side. But that's just my kickoff. Right, great. Um, thank you very much uh, for for your question, um, Bruno. I'll I'll start by just uh, perhaps making a differentiation between different types of engagement, right? And so, one thing, um, and so for example, you don't see gender gaps in in rates of engagement when it comes to, for example, 
voter turnout, right? So that's one way of participating in, in, in elections and in politics more broadly. Um, um, and in many countries, you also don't see uh, different rates of participation in uh, things such as like protests, right? Although you still do see uh, gender gaps, not only in, in Latin America, but elsewhere in, for example, rates of interest in running for office um, and perceptions of uh, self-perceptions of qualification to run for office. Now, there, there's a big debate they're about whether the, those questions in and of themselves are not gendered and whether they're picking up, you know, different rates of, of uh, engagement because of the ways in which they're asked. Um, and there's also research that shows that once women are uh, essentially recruited to run for office, then they will run at higher, well, at, at similar rates or become interested uh, to run for office at similar rates than men. Another thing that, that I was talking about here is the gender gap in vote intention, right? And so to support particular types of parties, ideologies, or in this case, candidates, which is something that we didn't use to see in Brazil and we still don't see at other levels of elections. And so even in 2018 or 2022, if we go to, you know, some national levels or if we go to other types of elections, we don't see this desperate, disparate, uh, gender gap and behavior, but we do see a gender gap when it comes to Bolsonaro support, right? And so I think that that I just wanted to clarify those things because I was talking about lots of different gender gaps, right? And, and, and different uh, outcome variables here. Now, this question about backfiring, I think that this is a really interesting question. It's a question that I thought about quite a bit back then. Um, and I don't, have a satisfying answer, not, neither to myself nor to others. And I think that partly that's a methodological empirical issue because you can't really isolate, right? Like whether, you know, it was the eighty nine that led people to essentially um, to, to make a decision or, I mean, there are alternative explanations here that, that potentially lead to that. We do know that, uh, that there is a tendency historically for actions to promote reactions but i think that there is other things to be said about what happened here right and so the 2018 elections and in lots of ways the 2022 elections were uh characterized by um this anti-partisan or like anti-candidate support right and so essentially um in lots of ways, it was uh, an election not in support of one candidate, but in rejection of another candidate. That has led um, to to one aspect of of the polls to be in, in, in 2018 for undecided for people to remain undecided for a very long period of time during the electoral campaign, and so. You know, one way of interpreting the higher rates of support for Bolsonaro post the 80 no is to say, well, what that led people to do is for people who would already support Bolsonaro to actually essentially publicly take a stance, given that, you know, the 80 no forces you to actually uh, more publicly uh, pick a side in a way, right? So it's not that it changed how people would vote, but it led people to essentially uh, signal in which side they were on. Um, and so, and I think that those are two different things, right? One thing would be like actually motivating people to change their vote versus identifying in one camp versus another. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the any known took place right before the first, uh, right before the first round of elections. And uh, undecided voters are making decisions right before elections. And so there is here a timing component. Uh, lots of people were making decisions right before the elections. And so here there is a timing component that also messes up a bit our ability to actually say what is it that led to what. Um, although, you know, yes, historically there is this idea of, of action and reactions and social movements. And so social movements reacting to, you know, threats and then uh, other camps also reacting to social movements, uh, you know, reaction to to that. Thank you so much. S Samira, you want to? Okay. Uh, well, 
Thank you for just, your just question. on the point of gender gap, we have Lucia Avelar popping in, and she is one of the first women writing on the gender gap in Brazil. So, sorry, Samira. No, no problem, Heinz. <laughs> well, um, about your question, apparently it seems to be a contradiction, but curiously, uh, the police officers support the release of weapons much more than the average of the population. Actually, 70% of the population is against the, uh, this policy from Bolsonaro. But the central argument here is the freedom to protect yourself and your family. But this is based on the assumption that the Brazilian state is not able to guarantee the security of its citizens. So uh, I think, in a way, weakening uh, gun control policies is justifiable because it starts from the recognition that the Brazilian state has failed and, and doesn't have the monopoly on violence. So, mm, mm. so let, let's share this uh, right and also this duty with the citizen because they state, they state fail. Okay, okay. Well, uh, would it be, just to uh, pick up on that, would it be reasonable to say that the message of uh, weaponization or uh, making it easier to to buy and use firearms would be a message more to is electorate on the countryside and less so for for the urban areas, as there was also this suspicion that uh, uh, making it easier to have access to weapons on the countryside would make it easier to fight and uh, repress indigenous movements and uh, uh, ambientalistas, what's it called? Uh, the, uh, Sorry, I'm not sure if I understood, but uh -huh. uh, you, you're, the question is about the uh, uh, releasing weapons in the countryside. Yes, and if, it's if it was for his electorate. more sense because if you don't have police station in in the city or in a, in a big area so if you don't have the the armed branch of the state there i can understand why uh, those people want to have a weapon inside home so i can understand that but i mm -hmm. can't understand why uh, a regular citizen in sao paulo needs to have uh, a gunfire inside home. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's the question. Maybe we should have some like different rules in legislation to access. Okay. Okay. Uh, Andrea, go ahead. Yes, now. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to emphasize that somehow, I mean, uh, especially Samira's numbers are always yeah, very scary to see. But um, so I have a question that I think it's for both of you in a way. Uh, it's for us to think about the Bolsonaro effect. Of course, we, we saw that the level of, of policies and resources allocated to specific uh, areas violence against women and so on he he basically it was not a priority but i think he also had a very strong uh, social effect now his his presence the way he talked his narratives but not only his but also uh former minister damaris for instance now was the, the minister for well family women <laughs> and human rights so i think my question is about um even if uh, lula's government now manages to change some policies uh, and, and, and in light of the support, the public support to Bolsonaro, and, and which uh, I think to a large extent we can explain by this conservative nature of Brazilian society, how do you think that this question of gender will evolve? Uh, because what we see is a very conservative, women are conservative as well, demands, so to speak. So it's, how, how can we um, 
include, of course, we always use the word gender and feminism, but in the end, we look at women's face <laughs> when we see a, a, a representative. It's, uh, so how, how can we deal with that? Close the gender gap, but with conservative women? We, we cannot differentiate, uh, especially if this is being discussed, uh, uh, not directly linked with political ideologies. And so my second question is uh, then more related to, I, I think, to Malu, because you said about these NGOs and the role of, you said, recruiting talent and training them for office. Uh, so I, I see that uh, in a way that was how traditionally parties, I mean, traditionally political leadership would be channeled through parties and, of course, social movements and all other uh, initiatives, uh, social movement very much bottom up. Uh, so how in this uh, NGOs recruitment, how, how do you, um, how can you we separate these women from political ideology in light of this increasing conservative, uh, women conservative uh, getting into politics? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrea. Those are really uh, great questions. Um, so in terms of the first one, the Bolsonaro effect, I think there is a lot to unpack here. And I'm not going to be able to talk about all of the ways in which I think that Bolsonaro will have an effect, right, uh, when it comes to um, both perceptions of gender and politics, uh, of, of the gender dynamics of politics, as well as, uh, you know, legacies when it comes to to who is it that's going to occupy policy, uh, politics and what is it that they're going to be doing. Let me start with, you know, when we talk about representation and here I'm like using Hannah Pitkin's conceptualization of representation across four dimensions. And so one dimension to think about is symbolic. And so in other words, you know, how is it that the people who occupy office uh, change the ways in which we think about what politics is about and the ways to perform politics and who belongs there? Um, I think that, uh, you know, Bolsonaro and his way of doing politics reinforces um, the notion that the political realm is masculine and that the way of doing politics is a very masculinized way of performing politics, right? Um, in, in various ways, uh, you know, violent, aggressive, but also hierarchical. Um, Damaris, uh does also, you know, perform in a certain way when it comes to expectations about uh, women serving as in a particular and traditional gender role. And so if we go back to the Maddie's first, you know, statement when she took office of the, you know, we're coming back to an era in which uh, girls wear pink and boys wear blue, you know, that is essentially uh, the the perspective of women occupying office in their roles of mothers, right? Something that Samita was talking about of, uh, of women in the context of families, right? Um, it's interesting because in part of the work that I'm doing with Deborah Thomas of the candidate of the candidate uh, support catalysts, we're also looking at public opinion and voter support for more diversity in, in political office. And one of the things that we do find is that both Bolsonaro supporters as well as non-Bolsonaro supporters uh, have this pro-woman bias when it comes to like surveys, which is not um, only found in Brazil. You know, these survey experiments uh, conducted around the world tend to find a pro-woman bias. In other words, this uh, voters, uh, you know, higher levels of support for hypothetical women candidates. And when we take this to focus groups and we conducted uh, 20 focus groups in total, you know, 10 in 2020 and 10 now, we do see that uh, this pro-woman bias comes from, you know, what the literature calls benevolent sexism or expectations of women performing very traditional uh, traditionally when it comes to gendered stereotypes and so of women as less corrupt, women as more likely to uh, be pro-family and support, you know, uh, uh, family structures. Uh, of course, there are essentially uh, ideological divisions when it comes to the rationale of supporting women, but that is to say that, you know, the right is also supporting more women in politics, but as you say here, a very specific type of women who have, you know, more conservative values and a way of doing politics. I always like talking about, you know, when people are like, oh, you know, this when when I get to do interviews and stuff like that and people are like oh you know should women vote for women and like stuff like that I always emphasize this idea that as men 
women are a heterogeneous group, right? With very uh, different ideas and priorities and conservative women are part of this equation too. Now, what these organizations are doing and coming here to, and so, well, to, to finish the, the Bolsonaro effect, I would expect, you know, we, we do see that the rise of women's uh, representation, formal representation in Congress was partly due to the increase of conservative women in seats, right? And so, uh, yes, women are increasing their, uh, the, their number of seats in Congress, but partly that is coming through the election of conservative women. And I would expect that to continue to be the case, given that we do see uh, increased voter support for conservative parties more broadly and women candidates who are supporting conservative politics. Now, when it comes to these um, to these civil society organizations, they have a different attitude towards, you know, the types of candidates that they're training. And so, as I said, although, you know, they um, most of them don't have a clear ideological um, ideological leaning, uh, most of them do have this uh, careful eye, I would say, towards uh, not only training people from marginalized groups, but training people from uh, marginalized groups who would access office in order to represent more progressive policies. Um, and so um, there are various issues that emerge also in the capacity of these organizations to actually elect people. And I can get more into that if that's of interest, because as we know, people cannot run as independents in Brazil, right? And so these people still have to join parties um, and then be socialized into parties in order to become not only become candidates, but have access to resources. But the idea of these organizations is to, um, you know, not only promote candidates from marginalized groups, but to promote, you know, good governance and a particular type of uh, platform when it comes to uh, rights uh, more broadly. Okay, Samira. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for your question. Uh... Good question and difficult question. <laughs> um, I think Bolsonaro's discourse made many people more encouraged to be sexist and misogynist. Not that they weren't before, but now they can probably say that they are misogynist and sexist. And um, I think this has practical consequences, right? We we saw uh, the numbers with people being violent because the discourse legitimizes violence. So that, that's why the, the hate crimes have been increasing the last four years in Brazil. But I honestly don't know how we're going to reverse the situation. Uh, perhaps it's necessary for us to reconcile as a society, but is, is this viable in the short term? Like thinking about what we are living now, uh, it's it's difficult to think. Thank you, Samira. Peter. Thank you so much for the presentation and for the discussion. I have a quite short question for both of our speakers. I would like to ask you, where do you see the biggest challenges for the next government uh, in the areas you have been talking about? And, and how do you uh see the possibilities of uh, the Lula government to to face these challenges i know it's a little bit general the question but uh so perhaps you have some ideas about oh i'm sure you have well let, let's try just just one uh, uh uh, I think the control of the police, strengthening the civilian control of the police is the main challenge of the, the Lula's uh, government in the next four years because, because of the radicalization inside the, the police and, uh, well, the, the military police uh, respond to the states, right, the, 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 the governors. So, uh, I think we need to reform the police. We need some uh, 
changes in the legislation in the federal uh, level that it depends on the Congress and it, it's it's definitely not easy it's not it's, I think it's uh, will be more difficult next year than it's in the it's now and 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 we are living exactly the contrary so the laws that in the congress the lei organica das polícias militares uh uh gives to the military police uh more power and more autonomy so the 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 the, the legislation that they are discussing in congress today uh gives to the the military police much more power and autonomy and I think the the main challenge for uh, Lula uh, will uh, will be reverse this this process and and create some relationship with the police officer because there are more than uh, seven hundred thousand police officers in Brazil, so th there's a lot of people with guns. Thank you, Samira. Uh, before, uh, Malu, can I just do a follow-up question to Samira? Um, uh, do you have, um, I mean, I know the forum has done research on the political attitudes of police officers. Are you familiar with this research? Obviously you are, but uh, you're very involved. Would you be able to share some of these information about the political attitudes, how, how you did uh, this kind of research and What's the outcome of this? Sorry, Malu. We made some service uh, with police officers in Brazil, and we found out like almost 20% of the military police officers that uh, were in uh, uh, interacting with uh, radical Bolsonarist groups on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, mm. the, the levels that the, uh, between the other uh, organizations like civil police and federal police are uh, uh, lower, like two or three percent, but between the military police officers, it's almost twenty mm. percent. So there's a lot of military police officers that are like supporting uh, dictatorship and the prison of the ministry from Supreme Court and sharing this kind of content. So that mm -hmm. that was the, the 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 metric that we we did to uh, to measure this uh, Bolsonarism inside the 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 police universe. So I think we should if we should uh, worry about some organization. The, the military police uh, is is the our main challenge in the in the next uh, few years, and we had this example in Ceará two years ago, right? And mm -hmm. with with the federal government supporting uh, the riot, and so mm -hmm. it's something that we need to face. And the military police is roughly half a million in Brazil, the total? Yeah, half a million. Mm, yeah. Okay. It's the, the, it's the biggest organization. Out of half, half a million is 100,000, so that's that's not... It, it's it's the, 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 the same size of the army. Mm, mm. Uh, Malu? Um, yeah, that's all really interesting, but also terrifying. Um, just going back to 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 Peter's question, um, I think that, that there, there will be a lot of challenges that Lula will face, not only when it comes to you know gender equality and the protection of human rights. Um, I mean, Lula will will face both budgetary as well as political challenges that he didn't face before, right? And so I've been saying that you know. 2023 is not 2003 and and it's a very different um it's going to be a very different dynamic for uh, for governability um you know even if we take back even if we if we go back to the pt years in government expectations about what would come out of these governments when it comes to 
women's rights and gender equality were much higher than these governments were actually able to deliver, right? There were some important advancements. And so Samita talked, for example, about the Maria de Peña law. There were there was also, you know, the late feminicidio. There was also the, uh, the domestic workers, uh, you know, uh, PECI, the, the domestic workers' rights. Uh, we also do see, of course, you know, the establishment and then the the disappearance of the uh, Ministry of Women that then came on to become what it is now under Bolsonaro. Um, but there was also, you know, some some gains that were made, not only in terms of women's um, substantive representation when it comes to, to, to po public policy, but also, of course, in terms of descriptive representation. And so we had more women in cabinets than, than in prior years. Uh, and of course, the election of Brazil's first woman president, um, who then went on to being uh, removed from office. Uh, but still, you know, and so so even back then, the, the gains were, uh, I would say, not was what was expected, definitely, right, of feminist movements uh, and women's organizations. Now, now we're in a much more challenging situation. Um, Dilma and Lula back then had to uh, abandon the rhetoric on abortion, and Lula had to again, you know, got into an issue with that in the middle of the elections this year. Um, so reproductive rights is something that's sort of out of the window in a way, right? But but I think that I have other concerns when it comes to trying to reestablish even certain um, certain rights uh, and institutions that were prior uh, previously in place. We have a very conservative uh, Congress, of course. Um, you know, Lula will, and, and he has already talked about the fact that this coalition. Um, will be more heterogeneous than it was even previously. And, and in prior years, it was already incredibly heterogeneous. And so the expectation, at least mine, is that this will be a more, you know, center government. Um, and so, like, less progressive than in prior years. And there is a, a, a key budgetary issue here that's really important in, in terms of delivering on public policies. And so... Um, and, and, and lots of the money that's already promised in other policy areas, in particular here when it comes to, um, you know, to, to what will now become again Bolsa Familia. And so I think that there are some, some things to, to think about when it comes to, you know, how is it that the government will be able to deliver on uh, when it comes to gender equality. Of course, you know, Lula at the same time is signaling commitment to uh, social movements and uh, gender equality and human rights more broadly. I mean, I think that the transition team is a good signal of that, that did incorporate uh, many uh, actors and leaders from social movements. I think that in a way that is also a return of the PT to, you know, to the basis, something that Lula has been talking about during the campaign trail. Um, but and it was interesting that in his first announcements of of ministry uh, of ministries and, and and the first ones were all men. He did say, "Well, but wait, there will be women here. Hmm. You know, there will be Afro Brazilians here. Just wait. You know, they're coming." And so I think that he is aware that there is a high level of demand for these to not be you know marginalized uh, agenda items. Uh, and so, yes, I would expect there to be a return of the centrality of some of these issues, but the the extent to which he his government will be able to deliver on them, I think is is a question uh, about budget and 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 politics, really. Thank you so just much. One just one comment, because what Malu was saying, because uh, Lula said, way there will be women, but he didn't want to commit during the campaign to gender parity, right? Which Sorry. was quite disappointing. <laughs> yes. I mean, if com compared to Bolsonaro, anything is good and, <laughs> but, uh, well, anyway, uh, Gerd Kolleb. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, I would have two questions. The first one is, within your research work, had you any possibility to make any regional differentiation of your results of your research? Not only urban-rural, but 
regional differentiated within Brazil. I'm thinking yeah, about uh, gonna, oh, I'm looking at the cross or at the frontier it's another activity of, of police or political organs, uh, for example, as maybe in southern Brazil and the rural areas. So, Mira, would you like to go ahead? Yes, there's a lot of difference. So, uh, uh, I would say that the police officers, the police organizations from the south and uh, especially from the South, are more conservative. So it reflects the same, um, the same thing that we can see on the vote. So the South is voting and supporting for Bolsonaro, and it is the same in, inside the police forces. So they're, uh, they're much more... Uh, moral uh, in a moral way and conservative conservative way like supporting bolsonaro then in the northeast of the country for example the, the, the police force from the northeast but in general uh i think we have more uh more than the regional difference what we can we can see that really uh, uh, approximate these different uh, police forces, and we have like 27 military police and 27 civil police in Brazil, is the idea of militarization. So that we have some, it, it, it could be uh, awkward or weird for a foreigner, like to 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 uh, heard something like that, but we have twenty seven military police, but some of them are more military military and has more militarization than others, and we can see this in the the levels of the use of force, for example. So when we 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 look to the military police from Rio de Janeiro or São Paulo. We have high rates of use of force and uh, many the number of uh, 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 people that are killing in in police operations and the use of deadly force between police officers are like really high. But we can see something like that in some like in some states from the northeast like. Alagoas or uh, Rio Grande do Norte, but in Bahia, it's also in the Northeast. So it, it, I, I would say that it's a mix from the militarization and also uh, organizational culture. So uh, the when they are much more conservative and much more militarized, they are they they tend to support more Bolsonaro. Okay. Before giving back to Malu, I would just ask you the follow-up question, Samira. Uh, I mean, this federal organization is also a sign of hope uh, because it's not uh, it the the, the, uh, the military and the position of the military and the uh, and the key positions in both the civil and military police do not depend only on one government but on twenty-seven. So this uh, federal organization, a kind of, uh, yeah, is a, for me, it's a sign of hope, of hope of distribution of power. But my question would be, to what extent does this politicization of part of the military police depend on the position of the governor? And how can he uh, depoliticize uh, or neutralize uh, these tendencies by appointing moderate uh, uh, leaders within the military police. Does this politicization, I mean, this is highly speculative, but does this politicization depend on how politicized the key positions are and how can these key, uh, key positions, the, the commanders in force, how can they uh, depoliticize or contribute to a more neutral uh, uh, trend in these uh, military police and civil police forces? 
uh, yeah, you're right. It, 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 the, the idea of the, the federalism of the, 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 the Brazil, it's, it looks like something that we distribute this power. It's not only in the central government, but we have a problem in the case of the police that they have like two comments because uh, we have the governor, the, uh, the state level, but they're also, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, reserve, reserve force of the army. Mm -hmm. And it's in the constitution. So they have like two comments. So this is one problem. Mm -hmm. And when, when, you, uh, when you talk about the governor and the political leadership, I think that the, the only way it's like being uh, really strict about police control. And uh, I can give you an example from Rio de Janeiro. So uh, in Rio, the last, the, 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 the last governor, uh, forgot his name, who suffered in pitch. Uh, there were so many. <laughs> Vito? Yeah, oh, oh, Vito, yeah, Vito. <laughs> uh, Vito Ubrevi. So what he, he did, he eliminated the, the secretary of uh, uh, state security. And what he did with it, so the command of the military police and the commander from uh, civil police uh, reports directly to the the governor. Mm -hmm. So this is really bad. Thinking mm -hmm. about uh, the strict the strict control of the police and thinking about the civil control of the police forces. So and it's, it's, this is probably a tendency. So uh, the or new governor in São Paulo promises the same. I think he he, he give up, but. But he promises the same. Well, we don't need uh, uh, a secretary of uh, public security. We can so the 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 leadership from the police forces can speak directly through the state governor. So I think that's or the main risk. Thank you, uh, Malu. Would you like to respond? Some, do you have something to add in terms of regional? I don't think I have much to add in terms of regional uh, differences. I, I don't have any data on, you know, the women's movements uh, back in 2018. One thing that I can say about the candidate support catalysts is that some of them, so the ones that are national have now moved, many of them have moved into a model of recruiting candidates um, like recruiting people to train through regional quotas because before that they were over recruiting people from uh, the South and Southeast, but the Southeast especially. And so now they tend to have a more uh, balanced representation from people from across the country. Um, but there are certain organizations that are based at the state level uh, or even some that focus on particular municipalities. Um, these do tend to take into account, uh, you know, more local political contexts. And so, for example, quite a few initiatives based in the north focus on promoting uh, the political presentation of indigenous people um, specifically, right? And so you do see these regional variations that do then reflect uh, local realities. Um, we. We're collecting more data now, as I was saying, and then we'll we'll also be able to see whether, for example, there are regional disparities when it comes to access to resources, uh, to level of institutionalization, uh, to the survival of these organizations, etc. But we don't have these data yet. Mm. But one might want to add, uh, Gerd Kolep, that uh, interestingly, uh, in Brazil, the regional uh, distribution of descriptive representation of women doesn't follow the pattern of tradition, modern in terms of northeast and north being traditional, having less women, and the south and southeast having more women. That that's not that's not the case. Not even for de descriptive representation. You have a lot of uh, or a number of states in the northeast with the highest percentage of women getting elected. I don't know if you want to 
complement or if you want to add something to that. I think that you you cover that really well. And uh, yeah. I mean, I don't have the numbers here right now, but yeah, I mean, you do see that. Rio Grande do Norte. Yeah, you don't you don't map out uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's based on like things like HDI, right, or or anything mm -hmm. else. Doesn't seem to explain um, mm -hmm. representation. Uh, one thing perhaps to add is that you know, in in the focus groups, because we also look at levels of support for uh, political representation of of other politically marginalized groups, including, for example, Afro Brazilians, who are the majority of the population nationally, right, but whose representation does vary across states. Um, and then um, we're now exploring whether uh, perceptions of the size of the population uh, influence level of uh, support for affirmative action policies, such as uh, quotas for Afro-Brazilians and politics. Um, one of the things that we did started to notice through the focus groups and that are not surprising, for example, is that the focus groups in uh, Bahia do emphasize the underrepresentation of Afro Brazilians a lot more than focus groups held elsewhere, and so we do see how you know regional contexts or local contexts also do influence these uh, perceptions as well as demands for descriptive representation. Okay, thank you so much for lending us our precious time and your wonderful thoughts and insights. Uh, we will take a break now for a couple of weeks and start again in January, on January 11th, with the uh, topic government and Congress, then a week later with government and ju judiciary, and our final session will cover foreign policy on January 25th next year. And of course, uh, while the first three uh, sessions of our series uh, were still with the Bolsonaro government. So in January, we already will have the new government. And well, we will see. We will know how many women will be in the cabinet and the, some more things. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.